Hi, it's Moser with a quick tutorial on cells, moving stuff, part one, passive transport. After this video, you should be able to tell the difference or distinguish between active and passive transport in cells, predict the direction of water flow when a cell is placed in a solution whose concentration is known, and explain how cells use transport to maintain homeostasis. You already need to know your basic cell structures. Let's get started. Remember these guys, our little cell friends, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, simple bacterial cells, the prokaryotes, and slightly more complicated plant and animal cells. Well, they've all got work to do, and part of that work involves moving materials in and out of the cell. Like what, you ask? Well, like water, for one. Cells have to maintain their water balance so that they don't swell up or shrink down and shrivel. They also have to get glucose in and out of the cell. If they're going to run cellular respiration, and they all are, Speaking of cellular respiration, that means they have to transport oxygen and CO2 in and out of the cell. And, let's not forget, cellular wastes. Because cells do have waste products, and those waste products have to be transported out of the cell so they don't drown in their own waste. Ooh. So now let's think about something a little more pleasant than cellular waste. Hmm. <sighs> Waking up to the smell of fresh baked bread. You really can't beat that. So... I'm guessing that you don't sleep in the kitchen, and I'm also guessing that nobody bakes bread in your bedroom, so how can you smell the bread all the way up there? All those smell particles, the little tiny pieces of chemicals associated with bread, shouldn't they be down in the kitchen? Well, that's where they started off, in an area of high concentration of, we'll call them bread particles. But, considering that the rest of the house was an area of low concentration of bread particles, there's an opportunity there. Those bread particles spread out. They take up all the space in the house. This is diffusion, and it's the movement of particles from an area of high concentration, in this case, the kitchen, to an area of low concentration. In other words, the whole rest of the house, which is why you can smell bread baking all the way up in your bedroom. If we drop some food coloring in a glass of water, we can see a similar phenomena. We start off with an area of high concentration, the little glob of food coloring, and a large area that has a low concentration of food coloring particles. Over time, those food coloring particles will diffuse through the water until it gets pretty close to a state we call equilibrium. Eventually, we'll see something that looks like this. It's completely mixed. The particles have made a pretty even concentration everywhere. This is the state we call equilibrium. It means there's an even concentration of particles throughout whatever we're talking about. This difference in areas of concentration is called a concentration gradient. And we can think about it like a grade or a hill, where areas of high concentration have lots of particles and areas of low concentration have few or none. The hill metaphor also works if we think about moving stuff up or down this gradient. Would you? be willing to volunteer to move this rock down the hill? It doesn't take much, does it? One little tap and it's going to go right down the hill. Not a whole lot of effort. What about moving it up the hill? Are you willing to volunteer for that? Oh, that's a different story. Yeah, that's going to take a little more work. When we move things from a low concentration to a high concentration, Oops, when we move things from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, in other words, roll the rock down the hill, no energy is needed. But if we want to go the other way and move things from an area of low concentration to one of high concentration, that will require energy. Well, what does any of this have to do with cells and moving materials? Let's imagine a cell, maybe a simple prokaryotic cell, and this is an even more simplified prokaryotic cell. I've removed the cilia and the ribosomes. So just a cell membrane and some DNA. And inside that cell, of course, we have cytoplasm and cytosol. And the cytosol, you'll remember, is the sort of watery jello stuff inside cells. Now, there are also little particles. There's glucose. All those things, the oxygen and carbon dioxide, cellular wastes, that cells have to keep balanced. Remember that what separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell is the cell membrane, which is semi-permeable. Permeable is something that things can pass through, and semi-permeable means that some things can pass through it. So in both our cell 
and in the solution that it's sitting in, in this little beaker we've made up, we have water, the blue dots, and we've got salt or other particles, and these could be any kind of particles, um, sodium ions or chlorine ions, anything like that. The yellow arrows represent the movement of water. And water will diffuse across that semi-permeable membrane. It'll go into the cell, it'll leave the cell, in and out and in and out and in and out. That's pretty normal. We call this osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane, like the cell membrane. Now, as long as the concentration of salt or other particles outside the cell is the same as the concentration of salt and other particles inside the cell, the motion of water continues and the same number of particle, same number of water molecules per second will diffuse into and out of the cell. We call this an isotonic solution. So the particle concentration is the same on both sides of the semi-permeable membrane, and the cell's happy. It's maintaining homeostasis without doing anything. Water diffuses in, water diffuses out, concentration remains the same. The cell is in equilibrium with the solution that it's in. Life is good. But what if we change things up a little bit? What if we put our cell with all those salty particles in it into, for instance, distilled water? Now, the solution that the cell's in has a very high concentration of water and a very low, as a matter of fact in this example, zero concentration of salt. While relative to the solution, the cell now has the lower concentration of water and the higher concentration of salt. We call this a hypotonic solution. The particle concentration is lower in the solution than it is in the cell. What does this mean for the movement of water? Ooh, I'm glad you asked. Water will still diffuse in and out of the cell across the semi-permeable membrane, but the rates of diffusion will not be equal. Far more water is going to diffuse into the cell. Hmm, does this seem like there might be a problem? Sure enough, if we put a cell in a hypotonic solution, one where the particle concentration is lower outside the cell, the cell will actually burst. We call this lysis. It's cell rupture. It's not a good thing. So what if we turn the tables? What if we place our cell in a situation where the solution that it's sitting in has a lower concentration of water and higher concentration of salt than the cell itself? This means that now the higher concentration of water is inside the cell. This is called a hypertonic solution, where the particle concentration is higher in the solution than in the cell. What does this mean for water movement? Well, as before, we'll still see water diffusing in and out of the cell, but once again, the rates are not going to be equal. It's as though water is charging into the area that has the higher concentration of particles, not water, the salt, whatever. And what happens is a net flow of water out of the cell. That's not good. As a matter of fact, if we place a cell in a hypertonic solution, it'll shrivel up until it looks like, hmm, cell jerky. Ew. This is actually why salting meat is how we make jerky. We pull water out of those cells. Oh, well, that makes sense. Okay, so we know about osmosis, about moving water in and out of the cell. That's able to travel right across the cell membrane. But don't we have other stuff we have to move in and out of the cell? Indeed we do. The funny thing is that if you look up close and real personal at a cell membrane, you'll find that it's not quite what you think. You might think it's like a layer of a plastic bag or a piece of tin foil. In fact, it's made up of two layers of what are called phospholipids. Lipid means fats, and these are actually, well, fat molecules. They're all lined up with their little heads facing outward and their little tails facing inward. We call this the phospholipid bilayer. Remember, bi means two. So interspersed in this whole little arrangement of phospholipids, well, we find these weird structures made of protein. First, let's talk about the environment the cell's in. There are other particles than water that need to move in and out of the cell. 
Here I've got some big green blobs. These could be salt particles, ions, we don't really know. But obviously, inside the cell, we have a lower concentration of ions than we do outside the cell. That's where these weird structures come in. Those weird structures are, in fact, proteins. They're called ion channels, and a channel is just a way to get through something. These channels allow charged particles, or ions, to travel through the cell membrane, even though they can't travel through on their own. And because they're still moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, it doesn't take any energy. They do get a little bit of help just by having that passage. We call this process facilitated diffusion. They're still diffusing, they're still moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration, but they get a little helping hand from the ion channels. Okay. In all of these situations, cells in isotonic solutions, cells in hypotonic solutions, and cells in hypertonic solutions, no energy is being used because we're moving particles to an, from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. It's easy as rolling down a hill. We call all these forms of motion of particles passive transport because they don't require any energy. Facilitated diffusion is also a form of passive transport because once again, no energy is required to move down a concentration gradient. Do you think that you can tell the difference between active and tra passive transport in cells? Hint, it's energy use. Can you predict the direction of water flow when a cell is placed in a solution whose concentration is known? I think you can. Can you explain how cells use transport to maintain homeostasis? Well, you've, you've got the starts, but We'll flesh that out a little bit more when we get to active transport.